Hi, I'm Jake Donham. Uh, I'm an engineer at Twitter. I work on back-end infrastructure stuff. Oops, what happened here? Where are my buttons going automatically? OK, I want to tell you about a project that I work on at Twitter called Stitch. Uh, it's a library for service composition. Um, I'm going to start out by trying to explain what the problem is that uh, I want to solve and uh, tell you a little bit about the Stitch API and then give you a handful of examples of cool things that you can do with this API. And um, I just want to preview by saying that uh, this kind of fits into what Marius was talking about yesterday about picking a nice functional abstraction to solve some uh, pragmatic problem uh, that we run into in a big system like Twitter. Um, OK, so this is kind of a schematic overview of the service-oriented uh, architecture that we have at Twitter. Um, there are just tons and tons of services and services calling services and little knobs and, and things uh, hanging off everywhere. At least that's what it feels like. Um, so a typical application at Twitter is built of many services. The stack is, is both deep and wide, and we have services calling services all the way down. Um, we would use Thrift, RPC for communication among all these things. And it's very typical to have batch APIs in these services. So uh, the reason for this is just to amortize the cost of traversing the RPC stack. Um, so a pretty typical API would be uh, get me the tweets uh, for this sequence of IDs and return a sequence of tweets. Um, so that's sort of the setting that we're working in. Um, so we have this new problem of like service-oriented programming. How do you uh, write an application that's composed of dozens of services, and how do you structure your code so that it can uh, have good concurrency across all these services, um, take advantage of these batch APIs for efficiency, and still be clear and modular and flexible and all the things that we would like out of our code? Um, it turns out that these wants are often in conflict, and particularly I want to talk about the, the problem of the batch APIs. Um, OK, so let me, let me talk about the problem of the batch APIs. Um, so this is a pretty typical uh, thrift level interface at Twitter. Um, what we have here is some request type and some response type. And the request type is kind of heterogeneous. There's, there's a few different arms of it. And the responses match up with the requests, right? So when you make a, a rec A, you get back a response A. When you make a request B, you get back a response B. And often. Um, this is a much larger uh, set, of, set of instances for the trait. Um, so then we have this typical batch-oriented API where we take a sequence of the requests and return a future of a sequence of response. So this is kind of the, the setting that Marius was talking about where all of our um, RPC calls are represented by futures. Um, OK, so that's the situation. So, so what happens um, when you're trying to call this API? So the first thing is that you have to kind of build up a batch of requests. And depending on what you're doing, um, this might be kind of a pain because it's sort of a non-compositional thing, right? So you, you may be composing a bunch of functionality, but if you want to, uh, the request to a particular backend service to be batched, you have to sort of extract um, the different places in your composed request uh, that, you need, that you need to put into the batch. So then we, uh, we make this call against the batch API, and now we need to match up the requests and the responses. And um, the normal case is that we get back a response of the correct type, but there's this sort of can't happen case, which is that we made a request of one type and got back a response of another type. And we're sort of exposing that to the application level, which is, which is not that nice. Um, so let me show you how this looks uh, with Stitch. Um, the big idea of Stitch is that instead of dealing in batch APIs, we expose these single key APIs, which can be uh, type safe for that single key. Um, and then all the batching happens behind the scenes. So when we actually run um, a Stitch query, um, it sort of figures out the batches for you, and you don't have to do that manually. So in this case, we would expose, instead of a single batch call with this heterogeneous type, uh, we would expose two homogeneously typed um, individual key calls. So the request A returns the stitch of response A, and request B returns the stitch of response B. And then we can sort of work on this thing um, in a type safe way. So this stitch join is just saying that we want to make these two calls concurrently. Uh, if you've used the futures API, it has a similar uh, future join. And then we always get back a type, sa type safe response. Um, OK, so then this problem also comes up on the server side, which is that we want to implement this heterogeneous uh, batch API. So um, we've got in the sequence of requests, and they can be of any type. So we want to handle them all concurrently, right? And it's very typical that what we're doing in handling this request is passing things off to some deeper level of the service stack. And all of those, uh, the things below us, also take batch APIs. 
And so what we want to do here is, in sort of a clean way, um, process each of these requests individually, but we would still like to get uh, batching when we call the next layer of services. This is actually really a pain. So um, you can sort of imagine how would you, uh, what you'd like to be able to do is just map sort of a request handler of these things and then collect up all the responses asynchronously and return them. Um, but that doesn't actually achieve any batching, right? So you are sort of forced to um, keep track of which requests resulted in which downstream requests and then put everything back together as you return it up. Um, has anyone run into this problem in their own systems? Does this sound familiar at all? Nobody, okay. All right, well, I'm solving a problem that you don't have. Um, I'm sorry about that, but uh, it is a big problem at Twitter, and this problem has led to uh, really serious application architecture problems where the entire application is sort of structured around this need for uh, retaining these batches. Um, so again, here's this, how this works in Stitch. Um, we can actually write these single key calls and do everything in the really natural way, sort of process these requests one at a time, and um, we can collect them up. And when we call stitch run, uh, what we're doing here is actually finding all the batches and executing the RPC calls and converting the entire thing into a future that we can uh, return up the stack. Um, okay, so I want to tell you quickly about the stitch API. Um, so there is a monad for this problem. Um, this API looks quite a bit like futures if you've used them. Um, it's, it's really almost identical in the external interface. Uh, the internal implementation is really different, um, and I'll talk about that briefly. So we have the standard um, map and flat map handle and rescue for exception handling. Um, and again, this looks very similar to what's in future. We can make um, a stitch that's already completed with value. We can join two stitches concurrently. Uh, and get the pair as a result. Uh, we can collect a sequence. Um, this traverse is something which is not in future, um, but it's basically a combination of map and collect, and it turns out to be convenient pretty much everywhere. Uh, and then finally, we can take one of these stitch expressions and turn it into a future. Um, so what happens when you do that? Um, oh, oops, sorry, I gotta talk about service adapters first. Um, okay, so we have this sort of single key view of the world, but we actually have to talk to the backend services which do not have this view of the world. And so what we have are a set of service adapters, um, one per service, uh, and what we wanna do here is implement um, the single key call method that takes a request to a stitch of response. And basically what we're doing here is um, the call group is talking about how do you batch these things together. So it's saying, uh, if I get a call with this call group, it can be batched with any other call of the same call group. And the call group also explains how do you make the underlying batch service call. And that's what you, what you see up there. Now we still have this problem that the result of this call uh, might be of the wrong type, right? So we didn't really get rid of this type safety. We just moved it into a different place, but it's sort of in the implementation of the service adapter. So rather than application code having to know about this potential type on safety, uh, that can be in the service adapter. So the application code is really clean. Um, okay, so let me talk about how we actually run a stitch and turn it into a future. Um, so the first thing is we represent the whole query as a syntax tree. So when you make all these different calls on a stitch, um, you're basically just creating a new syntax object, so um, a flat map object or a handle object, and then there's sort of an interpretation layer which interprets this query. Um, so we sort of run down the query uh, looking for exposed uh, calls that we can batch together and make an RPC call, and when we get to a join, those are two things which are supposed to happen concurrently, so we can go down both branches to collect up calls. Um, traverse and map are the same way. Uh, with flat map, the, the issue there is that we don't know what the sort of continuation query is gonna be yet. So we haven't actually executed um, the thing that the flat map depends on, and so we might not know yet um, uh, what's gonna happen next. So we basically just have to pause there and wait for some asynchronous work to happen. So once we've collected up all these calls, we can group them all together according to the call groups and execute these batch RPCs. And every time one of these RPCs come ba comes back, we can sort of fill in the results that we got into the syntax tree simplify the whole tree, and then repeat the process. And that's how things are executed. And I don't know if people have looked at the implementation of, of futures at all or promises, but um, it's quite a bit different. It's sort of a, 
a, a future is like a mutable reference cell that gets updated uh, when the result comes back, and, and this model is very different. Um, but what this lets us do is sort of see inside the, the production of a stitch, which you can't do with the future. Um, okay, so here I just want to talk about a couple of cool things that uh, you can do with this API. Um, so here, uh, this is something that comes up in, in a lot of our batch APIs where um, these batch APIs expose like per key failure. So it, it may be that something downstream of, of the call to that key failed and we want to return that up the stack. And then typically we want to do some retries or something like that. Um, and so what you'd like to do is try an entire batch of requests and then the ones of those which failed, you'd like to make a retry just for those ones. Like, so you don't want to have to retry the entire batch because lots of them succeeded. Um, and then maybe when those ones fail, you want to do another retry with a, a smaller batch. So um, what I've got here is sort of a per key version of that where we're not going to try to retry uh, the whole batch, we're just going to retry um, this single key. So we're going to make the call um, use the rescue method to catch an exception. If that's a retriable exception and we have more tries left, then we'll just go around the loop again uh, with one fewer try, and otherwise we'll, we'll return the exception upstream. So this is really, this expresses the intent very clearly. It's very simple. There's no code here to collect up which ones, try, which ones succeeded and which ones failed. But when we execute this, we actually get the thing we wanted, which was that the first time we try all the keys, the next time we try only the ones that have failed and so on. So that's kind of nice. Um, okay, this is a totally different thing. Um, uh, the talk about play yesterday mentioned a little bit this issue of how do you compose a web page out of lots of independent components. Um, so this gets to that question a little bit. So um, in one of the applications of Stitch at Twitter, uh, we had mustache templates and we wanted to independently compose these um, asynchronous components that we're making RPC calls. So what we did here is just sort of translate these mustache, mustache templates into a stitch query, and then we can execute the whole thing and achieve this batching across independently written uh, pieces of the template. So again, we can just sort of plug together things which really didn't know anything about one another, but still get batching across those components and uh, completely concurrent execution. Um, and this is sort of a non-RPC uh, example of how you might use Stitch. Um, and we do have an application at Twitter that's using it this way. Um, you want to compose um, SQL queries. And this is a case where if you do lots and lots of individual single key SQL queries, your performance is terrible. Uh, but if you do a batch query at the SQL level, you get decent performance. So here's a way to do that, um, again, without exposing that batching to the application layer. You can make lots of single key calls at the application layer, but have that converted into um, a batch select call, as I have here. Um, OK, I see I have a little bit of time left. So um, I just wanted to first uh, acknowledge a huge debt to this Facebook project called Haxel. Um, Basically, all the ideas of Stitch come from Haxel. Um, I based this on a, a talk from last August, so the implementation is pretty different from the, uh, the Haxel one, but um, the ideas are, are all taken from that. Um, oh, and I wanted to, because I put this in the title of my talk, say one thing about the difference between a monad and an applicative functor. Um, so this is just kind of a, a geek out for a second. Um, uh, you may know that every monad can be an applicative functor in, in two different ways, like so you can, if you want to join uh, two things, you can um, sequence them, the first one and then the second one, or the second one and the first one, using the monadic uh, composition, the flat map. Um, but we don't actually want either of those, because we want these things to happen concurrently. And so that is sort of uh, the key difference here, right? So like, if you just take a monad and turn it into an applicative functor, you're not exposing the independence of these two parts. But that's really crucial to what we're doing here, because we want to be able to um, batch across those two parts, um, and so we don't want to sequence them. Okay, that's all I have. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, so um, let me go back to the interface here. Uh, 
So again, if you've used the feature interface, it's really similar. Um, I think what you're talking about uh, kind of corresponds to the collect interface. So we have a sequence of queries, and we want to wait for, we want to concurrently wait for all of them and then return the sequence of results. If any of those fail uh, in collect, then the whole thing fails. So just like futures, um, a stitch kind of embodies an exception, so it can either return a successful result or an exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, one of the nice things about doing things like one key at a time is that you often can sort of put your exception handling logic in the key query itself. Like, so you don't have to sort of collect up a bunch of things and then sort of handle the successes and failures. You can just put the failure handling in line to produce some results, so return a default, or call a backup service, or do a retry, or something like that. Um, so you don't have as much need for what you're talking about, but you certainly can implement that. Um, the default collect doesn't do that, but you can do something like, you can lift a stitch into a try, so that, that will always succeed, but it will succeed with a try, which is either return or throw. Um, I'm sorry, I should have repeated the question before. Um, you're asking whether the... Sure, okay, so you're asking whether the, the request object should contain the number of retries. Um, I think of those as pretty independent concerns, like the request is sort of semantically what it is you're requesting, and you're not necessarily saying anything about how it should be executed. And I, I think kind of a, a trend that's happening at Twitter is trying to get away from this sort of like manually specifying retry counts and things like that, and trying to just um, have some ob objective for success rate and, and try to have that handled as automatically as possible. So I think that's a good, that kind of points out how these are really independent concerns. Like the application doesn't really care about retries, like it just wants a successful response, right? Um, any other questions? Yeah, where, where <laughs> uh, Stitch is not, is not yet open source, unfortunately, but I hope to get it uh, there pretty soon. I've been focusing on internal adoption. Anything else? Great, thanks a lot.